We are going to pray for our nation's leadership as we normally do. <clears throat> and we pray based upon the exhortation given to us by the Apostle Paul in the letter he wrote to Timothy. And I truly believe the Holy Spirit was over all over every word of this. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. And this is who we pray for. So first and foremost, we pray for the executive branch, which is represented by President Trump and Vice President Pence. As a Christian, I'm going to say this, and, and I'm going to look directly into the camera because I want to make sure everyone... I'm going to say this. It is beneath your station as a Christian to refer to him or them in derogatory terms. Amen. To call them orange or that's just 45. That's President Trump and Vice President Pence, just as it was President Obama. Amen. Amen. Okay. It is beneath your station. And you know what happens when you live when you exhibit characteristics are beneath, that are beneath your station, you tend to live down Ooh, to right. it. That's right. Come on, now. So, if I was hanging out with my friends, I'd say, raise your game. Come on now, come on now. Live up to the standard. That's right. We're praying for President Trump and Vice President Pence. The legislative branch here in Virginia, our two senators are Mark Warner and Timothy Kane, and the House of Representative members who covers most of our congregation or all of our congregation here in Virginia are Rob Whitman, Don Byer, Jennifer Wexton, and Gerald Connolly. We don't have to agree with these people. We have to pray for them. That's right. Election day, you don't like the name, vote for another name. The day after election day, you pray for whoever won. Our Maryland Senators are Benjamin Cardin and Chris Van Hollen and the House of Representative members who covers our congregation there are Anthony Brown and Jamie Raskin. We pray for the Judicial Branch, represented by the Supreme Court, headed by Chief Justice John G. Roberts and Associate Justices Kavanaugh, Ginsburg, Alita Kagan, Thomas, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Gorsuch. We pray for the Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and Attorney General of our respective states. In Virginia, that would be Ralph North and Ju Justin Fairfax and Mark Herring. And in Maryland, that would be Larry Hogan, Boyd Rutherford, and Brian Frosch. And this is how we pray. This prayer is nonpartisan. There is no blue agenda, no red agenda, no bloods, no crips, no none of that. We're praying for them. We're praying them into the perfection, I believe, that the Father sees them through. Amen. Because I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Jesus praying for you and you ain't perfect. Amen. Come on, Amen. Thank you, Lord. Jesus has been interceding for me since May 5th, 1969, and I ain't lived a perfect day yet. Didn't stop him from praying, though. I said May 5th, night. no, he's been praying for me since the beginning of time. Because he knew I was going to need to help. <laughs> and this is how we pray. Father, we thank you for our current president, President Trump, and the other members of our government's leadership. We ask for divine wisdom and knowledge for them so that they may effectively minister to and govern your people. In Jesus' name and in his stead, we stand on earth while seated in heaven in him, speaking to the forces of Satan, looking to influence their decisions and cause trouble for them. And this is what we say. Shut up and stop your movement. You know, you are a blood-bought son and daughter of God. You don't need to discuss nothing. 
N-U-F-F-I-N. Nothing with the devil. <laughs> you don't discuss it. You tell him what to do. We pray that the President, Supreme Court, Congress, and other officials are filled with a personal and intimate knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Let them be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to you who has enabled all of us to share in the saints' inheritance and light. Enable them to stand mature and fully assured in everything that is your will for us. We pray that their love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of insight so that they will be able to determine what is best and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ and that Jesus will fill their lives with everything that your approval produces. Father, increase their love and their ability to know your love. We know and are fully assured in the knowledge that all authorities on earth are established unto you. By your power, fulfill every desire for goodness and work of faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified by us and then us by you. We pray that love will be the ground that we all sink our roots into and on which we have our foundation and that you will give us a gift from the wealth of your glory with inner strength and power through your spirit. And Father, we also pray for the surrounding geographic districts, the Sully District where the church is located, the Drainsville District, the Black Arrow shows where the church is, the Hunter Mill District, the Braddock District, the Providence District, the Springfield District, the Dulles District, the Sterling District, the Broad Run District, the Leesburg District, and the Woodbridge District. With the addition of the Woodbridge, Woodbridge District, that's 68,700 people roughly from the 2019 estimates. That brings the total number of people that we are covering with our prayers to 1,107,504. Mm-hmm. We are covering those people with our prayers and this is the prayer that we pray into these districts. And we pray like the prophet in the Old Testament prayed when he said, there ain't going to be no rain unless it comes by my word. Amen. <laughs> We're praying like Joshua prayed when he says, son, don't even think about moving. I need you to stay right there. That's how we're praying. Because when you have been empowered by the Lord and given a word to speak by the very same Lord, it isn't a wispy, will thou be thou willest, King James. No, it is declarative in nature. It is forceful in its delivery and it is impactful in its results. And this is the prayer to this district of 1.1 million people awake to righteousness. And when we make that decree in these districts, we expect three things to happen. First and foremost, we expect prosperity to increase. Prosperity in both health and finance. Now, I, I, for one, know very few people who were affected. I do know people who were affected, but very few, who were affected by the, the virus. And one day, Mike and Sabrina, mighty man and woman of God, came to my office. And we were just sitting upstairs fellowship. And this was a, when the shutdown first happened. Like, and they said, you know, Pastor, you've been praying over these districts for months. And they pointed, I said, that virus can't take a foothold in these districts like it has pl- taken in other places. And I just never had looked at it that way. Our prayers are effectual. Yes. That's right. yes. And let's, to use a, a common phrase, the rest of the country could be going to hell in a handbasket, but because we're here and we're praying, yes. that handbasket is going to be lined with 
gold yeah. and cotton. <laughs> Just luxurious and soft. So we expect prosperity to increase. We expect crime to decrease. See, Satan is a thief. He only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we bring his influence in these areas to nothing. We silence his voice. And we expect an overall awakening to the things of God. And by God, we mean very specifically the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you agree with me in that prayer and decree, please say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Family, I, I, just, I just love this family. I am so blessed to be selected to be the pastor for this church. Uh, it's already 1125. <laughs> well, I will say this. I am, I'm very blessed to be here. And uh, mighty man of God said when I came to this church in 2008, he had a feeling that listen, I wasn't in the ministry. I wasn't even thinking about ministry. I was in retail. Um, I just was looking for a place that taught the word. And he said, now fortunately, he didn't tell me this to many years later. Because had he said it, I may have run away. But he said, I had a feeling that you were going to be the new pastor. He said, I had a feeling you were going to be a new pastor. I'm glad he didn't say anything because, and I'm glad Pastor Bill didn't say anything because I definitely would have run. But to be the pastor of this body of believers, I don't take it lightly. And I want to give you my best every message, every Sunday, every five minute of encouragement. I want to stay connected to the Father. I want to keep my ears constantly open. Uh, during yesterday's men's meeting, which was uh, just a phenomenal meeting, by the way. I want to thank all the men for, I want to thank those who joined in person and those who joined over Zoom. It was, it gave me an insight into how we can continually do that for Bible studies. So no, normally when we start Bible study again, which I'm planning to do next week, uh, I will continually keep both the in-person as well as a Zoom protocol. It is very simple, um, it, the participation is great, and some of you live a long way away. And if you wanna join by video conference, it would be great. So, I, I just, mm, it is such a pleasure and honor, I don't take it lightly, and I just want to make sure that I keep us pointed in the right direction. I want to make sure that no matter what happens, when I say no matter what happens, April 4th, no, I'm sorry, April 7th, 1993, I left Port Naval Air Station, Alameda, headed to Yokosuka, Japan. 14 day Trans Pacific journey. But throughout that journey, weather, Currents, things happen which made me have to every, I mean, we were taking positions every 10 minutes and making course corrections. Because if I had just dry, gone for 14 days without making any course corrections, I'm going to miss Asia. <laughs> but no matter what the conditions was, I always wanted to keep the ship pointed toward Yokosuka, Japan. Well, I mean, not necessarily because we do great circle routes when you, you, you don't worry about it. I just wanted to keep on track. Got it. A pilot might know about great circle routes. <laughs> I want to make sure as a body that the currents of the prevailing theme of the day don't change our focus and that we stay pointed in the right direction. Last week, as Minister Sabrina said, we did mention 
let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That was our whole topic last week is I am redeemed. I am redeemed because I am redeemed. There's a whole lot of stuff that I really don't have to worry about that I actually do worry about, but I don't have to worry about it. I'm redeemed from poverty, sickness, spiritual death. You don't even have to worry about those things. But what I want to do is always keep the main thing the main thing. There are a lot of things that are going around around us that are trying to, to, to divide us, that are trying to keep our attention focused over here. And, and all of it is used to just to take away from you your peace. Take away from you your focus on the Father. Last week, um, one of the five minutes of encouragements, I focused on Jehoshaphat. When he and the nation were surrounded, and he said, Lord, we're surrounded by enemies on all sides. I have no idea what we're going to do, but our eye is on you. I want to keep our eye on the Lord. I want to keep our focus on Jesus. I want to keep the main thing as the main thing. And when we do that, the one thing that we truly need in this country right now can be accomplished if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. If my people who are called by my name will keep the main thing the main thing, the unity that we so desire and need, the unity will be realized. We're going to, we are Word of Faith Church, which means I have to read scriptures or else it ain't legal. <laughs> we're going to take some scriptures today. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians. We're going to, I'm going to be, one of my favorite Bible teachers, a man by the name of E.W. Kenyon, uh, Joe introduced me to him when I came to this church. Uh, when he studied the Bible, he had upwards of 20 translations just spread out on his floor, all open to the same verse, right? And he would just be going from one translation to the other. And I try to emulate that. However, I'm doing it on my computer. <laughs> so I keep my, my, my software, I have probably 35, 40 translations. And I'm always trying to drive into what the Lord is really saying. Amen. So today we're going to bounce around. We're going to have some stuff in the Passion Translation. We're going to have some stuff maybe in the King James, the New King James. We're going to just bounce around. Here's my thought process on it. It doesn't matter what the translation is. Without the Holy Spirit, it's all. it won't mean nothing to you. Without the Holy Spirit breathing life on it, it doesn't matter what translation it is. Without him breathing life into it, it won't mean anything to you. So let's look in 1 Corinthians 2. And we're looking at keeping the main thing the main thing. And I, I look at Paul when he decided to keep the main thing the main thing. He says, my brothers and sisters, when I, came, when I first came to proclaim to you the secrets of God, I refused to come as an expert, trying to impress you with my eloquent speech and lofty wisdom. For while I was with you, I was determined to be consumed with one topic. Jesus, the crucified Messiah. I chose to forget everything other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, we all know that Paul, being the biblical, the scholar of the Torah that he was could have easily impressed the Corinthians with his knowledge. 
could have easily argued any of them under a table and beat them down with the scriptures. But he only wanted them to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is where the whole redemption of mankind, that is the message. And no matter what we see going on, we have to keep focused on the message. Jesus Christ and him crucified. One of the things that I believe Paul wanted, he wanted the power of the spirit to work through that singular message. The power of the spirit. Unless we keep the main thing, the main thing, the power of the spirit won't flow. Unless we keep the main thing, the main thing, we quench the spirit. All right. I won't be I, I won't be that. So I believe that you and I that this whole body I, I you know several years ago I did a message I said that the, the body of Christ was in need of a Juneteenth revelation. <laughs> and, every, and I kind of explained that not everybody knew what Juneteenth was at the time. And that revelation that you have been redeemed. And just like the slaves were in Texas who didn't know, that message brought great joy and I believe the body of Christ is in need of a similar revelation. Yeah. Because we all, if you ask any Christian, most of them will say, I believe I'm going to heaven. That's if they truly believe that the blood of Christ paid for the sin. Um, but sometimes the reality of that or the reality of its effect in our lives here on the earth isn't evident and people aren't looking for it. Amen. What do I mean by that? Well, if you buy a number five at your favorite fast food restaurant, you can look at the menu and see everything that's included. And when you open the bag, if something's not in the bag that's supposed to be in the bag that I paid for, we got an issue. When I say we're in need of a Juneteenth revelation. We need to check the bag. Right. That's right. Ephesians 4, 3 in the New King James. We are commanded to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now, there's a, a, a book that we all we've all had to read who are if we are in, you know, going through the Rhema courses called Ever Increasing Faith by Smith Wigglesworth. And he said that the baptism of the Spirit is to make us all one. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that by one Spirit, we are all baptized into one body and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So the Word tells us that we're supposed to have unity. A few verses later, verse 13, till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's 413. My job is to make sure we keep the main thing as the main thing so that we can realize the unity. Amen. However, I am sometimes disappointed because I don't see the unity. I know your word can't return to you void. I know that your word is forever settled. I know that you uphold all things, not by the power of your word, but by the word of your power. So as I look across the landscape that is Christianity, 
and I just start counting differences. If all of the Christian denominations, we look, took and lined them up and said, what is the basis for your doctrine? There are several groups out there, including Symbol of the God, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, who say that the Bible is the only source I would, you know, kind of fall into that. But then there's others who say that it is the Bible plus. The Bible plus whatever the Pope says, or the Bible plus whatever the... Book of Mormons. There is no unity there. Amen. So we're not unified by that doctrinal belief. What about, what about creeds and confessions? What about things that we say? Well, there's several sections of Christians who believe and confess and say the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. Statements of fundamental faith. There are some who even avoid creeds. I'm one of those. Which means there's no unity there. Okay, what about, there's got to be some unity here. What about the inerrancy and inspiration of the scripture? There are certain groups who believe that the, the scripture is the inspired and inerrant word of God. But there's also some Christians who believe that it is, is inspired, but not necessarily factual. Even though it's not necessarily factual, they believe that it is breathe, has the breath of God on it. In my book, there's still not unity there. <clears throat> Trinity. There has to be unity in the Trinity. Uh, no. There are many, many differing beliefs about the Trinity in Christianity. I still haven't found the unity. Okay? The nature of Christ. Christ is the Word of God made flesh. Christ is God in the flesh. I'm the only one I've ever heard say this. Uh, Christ is God giving birth, birth to himself through humanity. I mean, I, I'm the only one who's ever said that, but that, that's my view. But from what I can tell, all Christians believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. A little unity there. Amen. The resurrection of Christ. From what I can tell, all Christians believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried was raised from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father, has now been glorified. There's unity to that. There may not be unity on what we believe as far as the day that he was crucified, but everyone believes that he was crucified and that he arose. There's unity in that. Surely there is unity in salvation. Let me tell you, there ain't. Some people believe you can check in and out of unity like a hotel. I would check, check in and out of salvation like a hotel. Others believe once saved, always saved. I say, I don't want out. Come on, Stay away from me. So, there's not necessarily unity there. But Lord, your, your word, your, in your word you says, till we come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son. Where's the unity? Every once in a while the Lord will tell me, son, reread what you just read. Where is the unity? I never promised that you'd be united around doctrine. That's right. That's right. 
I never promised that you'd be united around a common set of core beliefs. I never promised that you'd be united around a common verbal creed. But there's unity in faith. And as I'm going through that list, pretty much the only thing that Christians are united about is who Jesus is and the fact that he died and was resurrected. Why is that so important? That is so important because, you know, earlier this week, um, one, of, one of the mighty men was here and I, you know, as I came off the field from doing the five minutes of encouragement, I'm sitting there talking to him and, and he says, Pastor, I, I just, I, I, I see so many differences. I'm like, listen, don't worry about the differences. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to say which side that he falls on on this argument. But there was a discussion as to whether or not Jesus actually went to hell on our behalf. And some say, absolutely, if he didn't go, I'd have to. And others say, oh, no, 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 he can't be touched by that. No, no, he, he only went there to, to deliver other people out of hell. I, listen, let me tell you this. The difference in that belief isn't enough to separate you from your fellow believer. That should not be enough to make you walk away from someone and say, oh, no, 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 no. Both have expressed faith in the blood of Christ. And unless we start recognizing what he has given us, we'll never realize what he has given us. Because we're always looking off into the future for what he gave us in the past. Amen. Till we come to unity of the faith. It is faith in Christ that, not faith in doctrine, not faith in Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal word of faith. It's not faith in none of that. It is faith in Jesus himself Amen. that should unite us with our fellow believer. And because we have faith in him, we have to allow them the freedom to have belief that we may believe are in error. Or in error. Because I have a shocking surprise for each and every one of us. When we get to heaven, we're going to find out that we missed it on a lot of stuff, too. Everybody has missed it in some way. And I am not going to cast someone out of Christianity with my mind or my mouth because they don't believe the doctrine that I believe, but they have expressed a belief in Christ. Amen. Amen. I, Christianity can no longer be about unity around doctrines. It's just the unity of the faith. <clears throat> and when we keep the main thing, the main thing, we get to stand on the opposite side of an event and look back at it with a completely different perspective. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. You know, uh, many years ago, I want to say 1978, maybe 77, most of you weren't alive at that time. I, re I realize I'm the old man in the room. 1978, 79, there was a TV show on call, Battlestar Galactica. I could not wait. I think it came on on Saturdays, and I couldn't wait for the next episode. And it was all about this ragtag group of humans trekking across the universe looking for this place called earth and my whole i'm like man how cool they, i just in my mind is they were millions of years in the future and they had all of this technology and all of this ah oh, it was such a great thing and then the series ended <laughs> but then in 2003 i think it was 2003 2002 it got rebooted And I did something. Listen, I, 
I have an obsessive personality <laughs> in certain things. So when the series came out, I waited patiently for five years for it to end so that I could binge watch it in a week. <laughs> I didn't watch a single episode while it was, but the day the series ended, got the DVDs and popcorn. <laughs> and it, it took about nine days, because you, know, you still gotta go to work, right? Who cares about showering? <laughs> but about nine days of binge watching five seasons of this thing. And this group actually made it to earth. They made it to earth and I, I was like, oh joy. And the very next scene destroyed my reality. They made it to earth. And the next scene, it fades to black and it says 150,000 years later. We're here. I thought all my life that took place in the future. That whole series of 150,000 years in our past. I'm looking forward to something that's going to, it already took place. 150,000 years past. Uh, okay, in nine days, I, I watched it. Okay. Go with me for one second. Matthew 6.10, in the Passion Translation. Manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on the earth just as it is fulfilled in heaven. We all know that to be, in the King James Version, the Lord's Prayer, where he says, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. When Jesus taught that prayer to his disciples, he was from the standpoint of it not yet being established on the earth. We are keeping the main thing, the main thing, and a part of that main thing is now we are on the other side of that prayer. The kingdom has come. The kingdom has come and the kingdom lives on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Okay. King James Version this time. Matthew 16, 28. Verily I say to you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit moved in and he's never left. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy. In the realm of the Holy Spirit. I don't often pray the quote unquote Lord's Prayer. Um, and I believe that the Lord gave that prayer to them to usher in the kingdom. And if you pray this prayer, and again, I, I, I don't often pray it, but I mean, there's times when I do. But when you pray it, I want you to pray it from a different perspective. You're praying with the reality of it in your rearview mirror. When I say the reality of it, it means everything that is spiritually necessary to take place has already taken place. Hallelujah. Every decree that needs to be made from heaven's standpoint has already been made. Every sacrifice has already been sacrificed. Amen. Because that's a true statement. There was some there. Judas didn't make it. But the rest were there on the day of Pentecost. When the Lord returned 10 days after he had ascended in the form of his spirit. John 
John 20, 21. Jesus said to them again, this is one we covered, Peace to you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. Then what happened? Then he breathed on them. As the Father sent me, I am now sending you. <sighs> Receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father sent me, a man that was to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. I am now sending you men who have been made righteous by my sacrifice, who've been cleansed by my blood. Now, <sighs> receive my spirit. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. I'm telling you that the kingdom is already here. And it is absolutely necessary for you and I to keep the main thing, the main thing, because it is from that standpoint that we are able to realize and recognize kingdom realities. And I hope, now, I, I know that in 10 minutes I can't put you in the same emotional state that I was in after nine days of binge watching something that I, you know, <laughs> but just that realization that it was 150,000 years in the past, the realization that thy kingdom come, when we make that decree, it is not a calling for, but a recognition of. Amen. Listen, I absolutely know that all the benefits of the kingdom aren't realized by everyone. I know that. But that does not take away from the truth of the fact that it is here and established. That doesn't take away from the fact, the truth of the fact, that you are kingdom representatives. And that when you speak and decree what he has spoken and decreed, your words carry the exact same weight as your heavenly father's words carry. Many of you were in the military here. I remember being uh, a midshipman at the, at the Naval Academy and, and there were times when we would be, I'm gonna use the term anointed to do certain things. So if I'm acting on behalf of the commandant of midshipmen, when I speak to someone, I say, hey, the commandant said, do this. That word carries the same weight because they know if they don't do it, they don't have to deal with midshipman lavender, they gotta deal with captain upset. <laughs> captain bad temper. <laughs> captain screams a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You are all kingdom citizens. The kingdom is here. It is established. What we have to do is yield to it. And it is very important that as we are addressing the issues of the day. And listen, last week was a very emotional week for me and for a lot of people. Um, there were times when I, I needed to just separate myself and go meditate. Go separate myself to remind myself of truths that I know, but when you're in the moment and when you're being faced with realities and when things are coming at you and, and, and people you've known all your life are saying things that, you know, like, that's really, uh, yeah. rather than respond out of emotion, I have to retreat, go somewhere and just meditate and remind myself of who he is and who I am in him. Amen. And when I do that, I get power to go back and face the situation, not from a standpoint of wrath and fury, but from a standpoint of love. Yes. Because unless I keep the main thing the main thing, I make myself susceptible to the emotion of the moment. Mm -hmm. 
You ever wonder why the Lord said, vengeance is mine, I will repay? It is because you do not have the capability within yourself nor the control necessary to execute his vengeance without damaging everyone around you. He will correct a situation without damaging the people around you. But if mighty man of God, this is my brother, so he is, if mighty man of God ticked me off and I'm mad, now, now I need to go, hey, I'm going to go shoot up a whole mall full of people because he did me wrong. No. We have to be that, that beacon of light that brings calm to the storm. Yes. And let me tell you, you're going to take some bruises. I'm, 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 listen, I am not prophesying. I am not decreeing this. In you. I'm just saying this is a reality. Jesus wasn't prophesying when he said, you know, in this life you're going to have some troubles. Don't worry, I overcame it. He just, it is what it is. When Jesus said, the poor you always have with you, that, he not, he's not expressing a desire. He's just saying this. I know y'all. <laughs> I know the systems that you put in place. Because of those, there's always going to be poor people. Not his desire. Okay. Not my desire that you get bumps and bruises on this journey. I'm just warning you so that when it happens, you can retreat and then regroup. Because let me say, I, this country is, is is now on a course. Changes are going to happen, and. How those changes happen and how people are affected and receive those changes will be heavily influenced, in my opinion, by how the body of Christ acts and reacts. Yes. Yes. And whether you want to believe it or not, they're watching you. Yes. Whether you want to believe it or not, they are watching. <laughs> you signed up for it. <laughs> so did I. Let's keep our focus on the main thing and every day. You remember during our, the, the five minutes of encouragement last week, I asked everyone to take two to five minute vacations every day. Now you can do this while sitting in your office, you can do this in your cubicle, you can do this uh, sitting on the couch next to your spouse. You can do uh, where you just center on the word and allow it to speak to you. There are certain words that speak volumes to me that won't mean a thing to you. In Daniel 2 when he talks about the lion that had the eagle's wings separate and he was stood up on his feet and given the heart of a man. <sighs> Actually, not Daniel 2, Daniel 4. Daniel 4 verse, no, I'm sorry, Daniel 6. Uh, no, Daniel 7. Ah, now I got it. Daniel 7 verse 4. The reason I remember that is because on one side of that scripture, when I say one side, where you are in Israel or you're here um, in the new world and you're reading that scripture, you have no idea what is actually happening there. And it is only after the event takes place where you can actually see it. The lion being when, when Daniel was prophesying animals he used to represent nations, the lion being Britain, the eagle's wings being the U.S., how he saw the U.S. being plucked out of Britain, and just so happens that that came on Daniel 7.4. There were no verses when he wrote it, but I always see God's hand in everything. Daniel 7.4, July 4th is when we declared our independence. Just a coincidence. Like I said, it won't mean much to you, but for me, 
every time I read that scripture, I, it's my father winking at me saying, hey, I, I see everything and nothing surprises me. Relax, I got this. Relax, I got this. Because if I don't relax, I have a bad experience through it. But when I do relax, I am able to see him in everything. Amen. You know what? I'm sorry. I forgot. We need to pray for the youth. All right, just, just give me one second. Everybody should be you, yeah. Most people are so and, and one of the things I, I want to pray for the youth, because like I said, I have, and by youth, I mean, I consider my daughter, she's 22, to be youth. But there are, are those who are under that age who were being hit with all of the negativity and all of the, the politics of it and don't have the perspective, the years of perspective that we have, don't have necessarily the time in the spirit that we have to be able to take the step back, and I, I'm so thankful for my daughter. When I, when I told her, she said, Dad, Daddy, all we can do is pray for them. And Come on, now. Which, she, which actually makes me feel good. I, I was really, I was looking at her Facebook, and I'm like, Lord, I, I don't want her to become radicalized, you know? But as I'm talking to her, she goes, Daddy, it's just that I'm 22 now, and I can actually speak out. Mm. And I said, Baby, I, I love the fact that you're speaking out, but I just don't want it to change who you are on the inside. Okay? And I don't want what our youth to see to change them on the inside. Growing from experience is one thing, but, but, but to, to maintain that goodness of character, to maintain that connection to the Father, to maintain that, that simple respect and decency that we believe all human beings deserve. And so Father, we just thank you right now that you have a greater care for our youth than we could ever imagine, that we could ever muster up on the inside of ourselves. You care for them far more than we do. Mm -hmm. And we decree over them, we pray over them, a protective covering of your spirit. And we ask for an increased ability on their part to realize and experience your presence. And that out of everything that we see going on in the world today, they will grow into the people that you have foreseen them to be when you call them. Our calling is to be like Christ. And everything that we go through are simply milestones on that journey or in that journey. And Father, I thank you for anointing and for sanctioning and for protecting our youth on that journey. So we commend them to you in the name of Jesus. And as my father, Herbert Lavender, used to always say whenever I left home, he would look at my mother and say, if the Lord is concerned about him and I'm concerned about him, one of us is unnecessary. Come on. I'm going to bed. <laughs> so I pray over our youth, mm -hmm. I pray over my daughter, I pray over all the youth of the country, and I'm going to bed and going to sleep. Yes. A peaceful, restful sleep, knowing that it is in mm -hmm. the capable hands of our Father. Mm -hmm. In the name of Jesus, Hallelujah. amen. Yes. All right, John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Mm -hmm. In verse 14, we find out that the Word took on flesh and dwelt among us. My brothers and sisters, I commend you to God our Father and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them, which are the sanctified. sanctified. Have a blessed day, family. We'll see you in the Welcome Center. Very nice. Yes, ma'am. You said you was going to pray for the youth. Oh.